Thank you, uh, Senator Young. Well, thank you both for being here today. Uh, Mr. Isaacson, uh, Isaacman, uh, rather, uh, the U.S. economy, national defense, infrastructure, they all rely on satellites extensively these days for GPS, for weather, for communications purposes, um, for surveillance, and, and much more. So a collision or a loss of, of key satellites could result in uh, even in catastrophic national security and, and uh, economic uh, costs. As you know, the, the uh, TRACS system, Traffic Coordination System for Space, was launched in 2024. It's being developed to uh, provide situational awareness data across civil, military, and commercial sectors. Mr. Isaacman, if confirmed, how would you ensure that NASA coordinates with <clears throat> Department of Commerce and DOD on space situational awareness and space traffic management efforts? Senator, <clears throat> thank you very much for the question. This is, uh, this is a subject that I'm uh, pretty passionate about. Uh, my two missions to space, the number one risk we faced was from orbital debris. Um, I, uh, for starters, I think NASA absolutely will play a role as you know they, this new frontier continues to open and ideally we have lots of space stations and lots of activity and a great flourishing economic environment in, in space. I believe all of the uh, information that we can gather from our assets on space debris should be funneled into a single mission control that has the ultimate situational awareness. But I have to say also that the biggest threat, Senator, is what we can't track. What is so tiny, the millimeter size objects at orbital velocity that can shred a satellite or, or a spacecraft. And in that respect, we have to stop adding to the problem. The United States is very good at not adding to the problem. I can't say that's the same for some of our uh, geopolitical rivals, sir. Maybe you could uh, speak with, with uh, a little more specificity about the, the gravity of the problem. Paint the picture for those who might be watching these proceedings uh, about how extensive this, this challenge has become, and uh, I'll just let you take it from there. Senator, absolutely. Um, the, uh, a lot of people think of whether it's a discarded uh, second stage in orbit or a defunct satellite as, as the problem. We know where they are, and we can, we can have trajectories that avoid them. The issue is the speck of paint that falls off that satellite that's now traveling at 17,500 miles an hour and can collide with another object going 17,500 miles an hour. I had an opportunity to visit the, uh, the NASA facility, the White Sands Missile Range, and see what a one and two millimeter piece of aluminum does at near orbital velocities, and I can tell you what it penetrates through is pretty, it's, it's, it's eye-opening to say the least. Um, it is an issue. We certainly need to do all we can to avoid any sort of kinetic conflict in low Earth orbit to stop adding to the problem. And again, I think the United States does a fantastic job at doing this. We need to work really hard to make sure others, maybe less responsible actors, don't add to the problem. Well, I'd like to work with you on this challenge should you be confirmed, as I believe you will be. So I'm, uh, clearly you're conversant in it, and it uh, sounds like you'll be prioritizing uh, this. Ms. Trustee, the FCC's... Um, International Bureau Telecom and Analysis Division, TAD, issues licenses to own and operate submarine cables and associated landing stations in the United States. Commercial undersea telecom cables carry approximately 99% of transoceanic digital communication, serving as a physical backbone for our internet. Since 2022, Russia has stepped up its attacks on, on this infrastructure. In 2023, uh, uh, Yiping-3, a Chinese tanker that had previously departed a Russian port, cut two Baltic Sea cables. You know, incidents like this, we're, we're reading about them on, on a regular basis these days. Ms. Trustee, what steps is the FCC's TAD office taking to protect undersea cable infrastructure and the sensitive data and information transmitted across undersea sea cables every day. Thank you, question, uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. I think this is such an important issue. I focused a lot on it during my time on the Armed Services Committee. This is such an important part of our critical infrastructure, and I think we need to do more to secure it. As you mentioned, uh, the FCC works closely with Team Telecom to review and approve undersea cable applications. 
I think we can promote more transparency in our foreign ownership in these undersea cables so we have a better sense of what the risks might be. I also think we should try to promote more US-led undersea cable projects so that we can eliminate the, race, the, the risks entirely. Um, in addition to that, I think exploring uh, the diversification of, of undersea cable routes um, to ensure that there's no single point of failure to the extent uh, an undersea cable is disrupted. But I think as a uh, protective measure, we should work on strengthening our disaster recovery and emergency response plans, given that some of these uh, cables are so vulnerable to exploitation. But if I'm confirmed, Senator, this would be a priority of mine. My office will follow up with you on, on some of your answers for further elaboration, but I do get the sense you're very much dialed into this. Uh, I, I'll just make one last comment, knowing that we have colleagues waiting. Uh, setting standards, Ms. Trustee, at, at the FCC through international governing bodies uh, is increasingly important. Uh, I think we have been outflanked over the years by the Chinese in particular, but also uh, by others. And uh, we need to develop a unified position here at the federal level between uh, the FCC and state and NTIA and, and, and various other entities uh, to, so that we can prioritize this moving forward. So we'll follow up with a, a question for the record uh, uh, about that as well. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.